First of all, I just, uh, how many, when you get the f pictures on the memory, scroll, they get the memory thing, you know, they, all the pictures, like, oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, you guys, is that like out of date now? No, it's like way cool? Okay, good, good, all right. Anyway, <laughs> soon to be probably, yeah, anyway. Um, but anyhow, so the, uh, my mom, a lot of pictures of my mom come through, and uh, she uh, passed away two, it'll be two years next Easter that she went home to be with the Lord. But I always think of her, and, if, and Pastor Don, thank you for that prayer for our country. Mom is a big one on voting. Uh, she said, did you vote? Did you vote? You know, like, you're going to vote. It was part of life. So, I mean, it's huge. It's a big deal. It's a huge responsibility. So again, as just second with Pastor Don's here. If you haven't, vote. But pray before you vote. So, all right. All right. So, um, anyway, I was thinking about mom, in particular, when I go, I'd go visit her. And a lot of times when I go visit her, it's the, the times I could get away, a lot of times in January, February, and she lives in Michigan. And I know it doesn't sound very bright, but I used to fly up there. And I know that God never meant for planes to have to be de-iced. That's just not of God, you know, but whatever. But thank goodness we can do it. But anyway, so I get up there, and I'd always, like, go visit her in the middle of winter, blowing cold. And I'd walk in, and I'd say, Mom, <laughs> she goes, what's the matter? I go, I am freezing. I'm going to die. No, you're not. You're not going to die. Sit down. Sit down. And then she'd say, I want to talk to you. What's, what's, what's going on? What, what are you doing? What, what's, really, what's really important right now? How's the family? And, and tell me what you're dreaming about. What, do you wanna, what, what are you thinking about? And somehow she had a way of just dialing life in. Not the past, but right now, right here. It was always so cool. I, I just, I, I cherish all that. And it has reminded me that when you're having a conversation, I mean, I shared this last couple weeks ago, when you guys, you're in the whole big thing of the youth, like in the moment, be in the moment, be fully present. Because we get into the past, hey, and I remember one time, my brothers, and we, we were talking about some story about some old guy that we were, knew when we were kids, and what the heck was his name? And mom, mom, you remember? What, what, you know, who was that old guy? And that, you know. She'd look at us and go, who cares? <laughs> Does it matter? Well, no, not really. So tell me, what, what are you doing? What's going on now? And she had a, a beautiful way of bringing it present. In fact, we've been going through the book of Hebrews on this journey the last several weeks, Pastor Don, Pastor Mac, myself, just looking at the letter to those living in Rome, the Jewish Christians that were in Rome. And you, if all through the book, we've been looking at the tension between the old law and the practices of the old covenant, sacrifices and all, and the new and how that tension has been all through the book to where the old kept that repeat of sacrifices over and over and you literally, oh, I'm forgiven, but then you're kind of dragging the sin along and you're just like, oh, got to be forgiven next time. I'll be forgiven next year. I'll bring the animal and all of that. Versus the new Christ died as the once and for all sacrifice for your sins all sin, all humanity, past, present, and future. All sin. And in him we have forgiveness. And when we sin, we go to him for forgiveness. As we look at this, this morning, the once and for all sacrifice, done. It's over. It's completed. You're forgiven in Christ. Right here, right now. You're forgiven in Christ. So let's jump in as we look at the author as he continues in chapter 10. And I, and I love how it continues. So chapter 10, verse 1. The, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming. Not the realities themselves for the reason that it never, for this reason, it can never 
by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year. Make perfect. Restore. Redeem. Make whole. Those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, they would not, they would have stopped being offered. For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all and would no longer have to feel guilty for their sins. It would have been over. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. Again, that's the way it used to be. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then he said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, my God. First, He said, the sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings, sin offerings, you didn't desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. And then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He set aside, the word here, the Hebrew word is, or the Greek word is, did away with. I put away, did away with it, replaced the first now to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy, hagiadso, cleansed. As you last last week, Pastor Mac, talking about the blood of Christ cleansing us. We have been cleansed, hagiadso, holy, through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Day after day, Every priest stands to perform the religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when the priest, Christ, this priest, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice... He has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Hagiadso, the cleansing, redeeming, sanctifying us. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, for the covenant, for this is the covenant I will make with them. And this is the reference to Jeremiah. The Jeremiah passage was written when Israel was in Babylon in captivity for like 70 years. So they're in captivity. The words of the prophet Jeremiah now are being prophesied down through the centuries. This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts. Cardio is the Greek word. Cardio, where we get cardio. Cardio is your soul. It's your essence of who you are. In your soul, in your gut, this is who you are. I will put my laws in their hearts and I'll write them on their minds. And the word for mind means your understanding, your processing. All of that will be the word and the law of our God. It will be in you. Then he adds, let's read together. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And there, these have been forgiven. Where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. As we look at this, the cleansing power of the blood of Christ the once and for all. It's over. It's done. That sense now of not living the dragging the sins along, they can't be completely released in the old way to now the new way, the today, the present, you are forgiven. Your conscience 
in Christ is clear. You have a quiet and I'll say bold confidence as a forgiven believer in Christ. Living in this forgiveness is living in his presence. I will be with you always to the end of the age. Literally, the Holy Spirit of Christ within us. Living in the new covenant is living in the kingdom of our God. Now, there's three aspects of the kingdom. There's the eternal heavenly kingdom. There is the earthly kingdom. The kingdom Jesus ushers in. And then there is the what we call the eschatological, when Christ returns, the establishment of the final kingdom of God. Now, as we sang the first song, heaven let your kingdom come, Lord let your will be done. This is the earthly kingdom. Hap, ma, uh, book of Mark, chapter 1. I want to read. It was after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, the forgiveness of sin, the new life in him. And he's saying this, the time is fulfilled. The time has come in fulfillment and the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom has invaded the earth. It is that realm that is among us that we are a part of when we trust Jesus Christ. We step into it and we belong to the kingdom of God. Paul said we're alien and strangers as in a foreign land. <laughs> you ever feel like you're living in a foreign land? Yeah. We're part of the kingdom of God. It is at hand. It is here now. Repent. Believe in the gospel, this life-changing message. This is what he's calling. Now, as believers, we're called to answer that in the will of God. How am I living that out? How am I answering and living in that place? As a church, how are we answering that kingdom call? How are we answering it for the sake of of all the different missional activities. You heard the list of announcements of all the things that are happening from the beds to the feeding to the caring to the, all of that that's going on. It's huge. It's who we are. It's not what we want to be or what we're thinking about. This is who we are. Living in the new covenant, living in the kingdom of God, Right here, right now. Let me share with you from my heart. I told you if you get the e-blast, I was going to share. I've been in prayer, asking God, what is it you're calling us as a church in this season of our lives? Where is it? What does it look like? In fact, Many of, you that have, many of you that are new, you just walked in, you're like, what the heck? This is pretty cool. But those of you that have been here a while, you know we have been through a season of what we call rebranding. We rebranded our name so we would be congruent. And that took like four, f five years. Where, where's Tim? I saw him earlier. Four, five years, Tony? Tony? Five years, thank you. Over a journey of five years, okay, <laughs> we finally got to the point of a name that is congruent with who we are and what we do. And thanks be to our God who revealed to us living hope. That's what we are. That's who we are. And in the context of that rebranding, We've aligned with what we call the Global Methodist Church, which is a much smaller organization that is fueling us to be that living hope right here in our community. Now, two things that are happening. First, what's happening is the missional needs of our community are growing like crazy. The hungry, the, the, the hurting, all of that, 
and who we are as a church and our community depends on us to reach, to care, to feed, and to do that. Those needs are increasing. The second thing is that through God's presence, he's raising up men and women who are feeling called into full-time ministry. I have never, Pastor Don, Pastor Mac, we have never stood here and said, listen, if you feel a call into full-time ministry, please come and talk to us. We want to encourage you, and we want to support you. Come and see us. We have never said that. The Holy Spirit has been messing with hearts and lives, people among our congregation, and he's bringing people to us who say they feel we sh- I should belong in this place. I feel a call from my God. Right now, there's over 12 men and women who are feeling a calling into full-time ministry right here in our church. That's huge. I'm thinking... Uh, From the interns to older adults. Some have quit their job and are going to school trying to figure this journey out and answer this call. So you have missional needs. You have people being called into the ministry. Here's the honesty of my prayer over the last year plus. Why? What are you wanting to do, Lord? Jesus, this is your church. What's it about? What do you want to do? Why? We don't need six or eight pastors here at the church. And this growing missional influence that we are called to be a part of. The Global Methodist Church is challenging all the churches to launch a new church. Every church launch a church. To help meet the needs in your community, launch a different, a new church. So here are my prayers. This is all really cool. We have these missional needs, and we have have the people being called into ministry. But wait a minute. We have a budget, and our budget right now is like I want to say maxed out, but our expenses and our income has has literally reached like a lid. We want to do all these things, but. How are we going to do this? And part, the biggest part of our budget is our debt. We have a debt, and it started out years ago, six, over six million, six point two, something like that. We have paid it down over the years. We've never missed a payment. Oh eight, oh seven. For those of you, you don't want to remember that, but we never missed a payment of our debt. We have paid it down to $2.2 million. Now, praise God. There you go. Hang on. So in the light of that, here's the cost. Every month, we pay $30,000 as a church. This is for all the properties, all the buildings. This belongs to us now since we disaffiliated from the Methodist Church. This is all of ours. So all of this belongs to us. And that debt is $30,000 a month. Again, as we look at all this, I'm praying, okay, Lord, what do you want to do? Last April, I got a call, and a man said, hey, um, I want to talk to you. And so I went out to see him, And he said, you know, and we walked around his property. He showed me his house. His wife had died a couple years before. And he showed me his property, and he said, I've been praying, and I truly feel that God wants me to leave all of this to Living Hope Church. My house, my five acres, my my garage, warehouse, the cars, everything, contents and everything, when I die... I want to leave it all to Living Hope Church. What would you do with it? (laughs) Well, you know, uh, I've never been asked that before. And he goes, my immediately, I said, you know, we have a debt of $2.2 million. And he said, well, right now, properties around me are selling for about $600,000. 
So essentially, you could have 600,000. What would you do with it? I said, you know, I'm really thinking, and I'd have to run this by my leaders and all, but I'm really thinking just put that right in the debt and knock it down. And he goes, okay, I want you to do that. I want you to tell me you're going to do that and let that be seed money for others to give. What he didn't tell me last April, he's had stage four cancer. He looked healthy as all get out. But in August, he was texting his nephew, and in the middle of a text, he laid down on the couch and put his hands on his chest and went home to be with Jesus. I've been talking to the lawyers that have it all in probate and everything, and the property is, I'm sure it's not worth as much now as it was back then, so it's probably more in the 500 range or so. But the lawyers are saying when it's all said and done, the church will be getting a check for around whatever the value, four or $500,000. We should have it by the end of the year or the first part of next year. Now, do the math. $2.2 million minus five is 1.7. I've been praying and I said, Lord, what do you want to do? And I truly feel in my heart, it's time to pay the debt off. It's time to pay and take what this man put in and for us to pay off the debt and launch other churches and meet the missional needs in our community. I pitched this to the finance committee. I said, guys, am I nuts? <laughs> and they said, no. We feel it too. I took it to the executive committee, the leadership. Help me. Is this, is this what we need to do? Yes, let's go for it. And so I'm telling you here, we're going to call this thing INK. I-N-K. Investing in the kingdom of God. When we pay off our debt and free up $30,000 a month that can go to missional needs and new church launching in our community, that is huge. And we'd be free, debt free, and lost. Next June, we're going to host the Global Methodist Annual Conference of Florida. That's what we do here. And when that comes, how cool would it be as Living Hope Church, to be able to say, we are debt-free and we are launching a campus or a church in our area and we're meeting the missional needs like we never have before. How about it, church? Amen. I want to use the King David approach. When he was raising money for the temple, he then gave first. And so I'll stand here before you, my wife and I are talking and praying. How can we make a sacrifice first? And then I'm the leaders, and then the staff, and then the congregation. This is everybody. And if you just wandered in new for the first time, wonder what the heck's going on, this is about us calling this place our home. And realizing it's part of the bigger picture of the kingdom of our God. When you look at all the things happening, oh, and I want to throw in one more nugget because I, I, I saw Rob, our principal. The school, Wesley Christian Academy with that big, beautiful building over there. Let me just tell you with a smile on my face, our school pays itself and pays their own bills and they have a waiting list of people wanting to go to our school and it's because of the leadership and our God. Amen. Amen. I got to throw that nugget in. But this is who we are as a church. Right here, right now. It's not a coincidence or, oh wow, God's sending people here. No. It is the Holy Spirit Raising up hearts with conviction of people saying, I need to be in full-time ministry. What does that look like? How do we have that happen? I don't know. God will show us. 
Is it a campus? Is it a church? What is it? He will show us. The missional needs that are ever growing, we will reach those. I believe we will not only pay off the debt, but we'll have a fund that will launch churches out of our church for years to come long after we are gone and new people are here. I truly believe that. So here's my challenge. I want you to pray. Because this is all of us. And yes, some can make a bigger sacrifice than others, but this is a sacrifice. This is above and beyond your tithe. This is a sacrifice that you say, okay, Lord, how much do you want me to give? Us, our family, whatever. I want youth. I want children. I want everybody to feel a part of this. I don't want us to sit back and go, oh, this is nice. And what are you going to tell Jesus when you talk to him in eternity? Oh, that was nice. No, why weren't you a part of it? Here's the, I'm just editor, you know what I'm saying? So I'm saving you a conversation. Anyway, here's the deal. Some of us are struggling financially. And you're Dave Ramsey and doing that, and you're, and you're struggling. You can give a sacrifice, but it's smaller. Some, you can give bigger sacrifices. It's not the amount. It's the heart, and it's the sacrifice. That's what he's calling us for. That's what the kingdom is about. That's what ministry is about. It's obedience to the call of the Holy Spirit at work, raising up the needs for missional and raising up people to be called into the ministry. It's time for us to raise up and meet the challenge. Thanks be to our God. Inc. Investing in the kingdom of God. You're going to be hearing more about this. You're going to be meeting the people who are feeling a calling in the ministry. It's all going to start happening. Thanks be to our God who calls us a place called Living Hope. It's just one chunk of his kingdom. But it's what we are a part of. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the morning and for your word and how here and now calling us to live that forgiven, hagiadso, sanctified life In your presence, Jesus, you died on the cross for our sins. Your blood was shed to wash us from our sins. In professing, in believing, and yielding our lives to you, Lord, we absolutely come. We come as your children. And in that forgiveness, Lord, we answer the individual callings that you have in our lives. And then we want to answer the calling as a church family because it's all for your kingdom. Jesus, when you said your kingdom is at hand, we know it's right here. And may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Jesus, in your holy name. All God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to share Holy Communion. And we're going to do it a a special way. So as we get ready to share in Holy Communion, I want to first um, explain that it is about the elements. But before it's about the elements, it's preparing our hearts. It's our hearts being prepared for forgiveness and claiming that cleansing power of Christ. And then it's the receiving of the elements. So right now, Let's just take a moment, wherever you are, and let us just pause and let us pray as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's table. This isn't about being Methodist or about being, you know, a member of the church. This is God's table, and you're invited. So let's pray. Lord, we come to your table ever so mindful that we have sinned, and we fall short. Sometimes the words actions, the deeds. It's in that shaping us that we realize how imperfect we are. But as we read today, you want to perfect us. You want to shape us and form us into your image. The hagiadso, cleanse us, sanctify us as we come yielding ourselves. Lord, we just take a moment. Right now, some of us, you know the words we've said. You know those things we've done that we're wrong. And Lord, 
Other times it's those thoughts that we had were far from you. As your word says, Lord, as we confess our sins, you are faithful and you are just and you will forgive our sins and you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleanse us in the name of Jesus. You are forgiven. Amen. As we come, reminded of how Jesus gathered with his disciples, how they were in the upper room, and when they were there, he took the bread, and as he gave thanks to God the Father, he then broke the bread right in their midst, and when he broke it, he then looked at him and said, this is my body. It's broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And then when the meal was over, he took the cup, giving thanks to God the Father again. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant for you and the many, for the forgiveness of sin, all sin, past, present, future, in me. Drink this in remembrance of me, he told them. This time I'd like to invite Pastor Don as we come. We're going to share, and first of all, it's a special day. And as we share and explain how we're going to do communion, I'll let Yes, today is a very special day because we are honoring the first communion of our worship readiness students, our fifth graders. If you're a new student or a new parent to our church, we have uh, everything we do is intentional. It's all about connecting kids and families to Christ. And we have children that have been learning about how to do the sacraments. And today's the first day they understand what First Communion means. So I'm going to invite the families of our fifth grade worship readiness class to go ahead and come on up. And uh, we're going to watch them first witness them receiving the sacrament of communion. So they're going to come on up to this stage and make their way across the line. Come on up. But let me tell you a little bit more about this. This is called the Path Connecting Kids to Christ. And if you haven't received one of these brochures, we have these at the back. But from the time your child is a baby, when they're born and you're putting them over in the nursery, they are actually planting seeds and they are learning already at young ages about what it means to connect to Christ. And every single step in the path is very monumental because what we don't wanna do is by the time a child gets into middle school, they will leave a church that they never felt part of to begin with. So we have a very intentional plan that in fourth and fifth grade, we do a class called Worship Readiness, where we are teaching them all the elements of worship. And that first Sunday of the month, you're gonna see our fourth and fifth graders here worshiping with us as part of our body of Christ. So they don't have Sunday school the first Sunday of the month because we want them to know that they are not the future of the church, they are part of the church now. And we're teaching them as they grow all about the, the different acts of worship. So today, as we come together, all children are invited to take communion, no matter how old you are. But this is the class that they now understand the sacrament and they wanna profess Christ this for the first time as they receive what God has done. And so as we witness the faith of all of us through their first communion. Let us, before we go, let us pray. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity as you have initiated these sacraments to us. You invite us first, and this is our opportunity to respond, to receive the love and grace that you have for us through this holy sacrament. We thank you for these children and their families to witness to all of us what you would desire for us all to faithfully pursue you and respond to you and your invitation to us. So Lord, we lift them up to you and we ask your blessing over this holy table that this truly would unite us all to your heart and your spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen.
thanks be to our God. May this communion be a reminder of the new covenant for which you live in, the calling, the purpose, the plans that he has for your lives. Thanks be to our God. Amen. God bless you. As you make your way back to your seat, I invite our hosts to come as we will serve our hosts.